Hello and thank you for joining me. This is Food Offensive Weekly News. This week I have a few news articles to bring you. Some things going on locally here in Colorado and around the country concerning uh, specifically genetically modified crops, the labeling of genetically modified organisms, and also show you a short little uh, cartoon, very informative cartoon uh, from the folks over at Natural News and, and, the, and the group that they've teamed up with in creating that called GMO a go go. It's it's quite interesting and and very informative. Very uh, on a just a basic level what GMOs are and, and what 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 they cause and, and kind of the just a just a breakdown and a basic uh, look at what it is. And so I want to show you that this week and really um, it's really going to just be a GMO uh, <laughs> based. Uh, broadcast this week. So let's get into this first article right now. It's concerning here in Colorado, uh, GMO labeling uh, bill put on the table and it was actually uh, voted out by, by the House. So I want to look at that article right away here. And it's, it's an article titled, Colorado Lawmakers Reject Required Labels for Genetically Modified Food. This is by Kristen Wyatt of Associated Press here uh, Wednesday the 20th this was put out and it says Colorado lawmakers Thursday rejected a proposal that would have required genetically engineered food to be labeled amid fears that the mandate would burden farmers and raise food prices the Democratic House committee voted seven to two against the bill and they after hearing five hours of emotional testimony uh, lawmakers ultimately sided with farm groups that said the change would need to be done on a federal level and not by an individual state. So here, uh, our representative here, right where I right where I reside here in Littleton, Colorado, Representative Kathleen uh, Conti, she's a Republican, and it looks like she's siding with the idea that they should uh, it should be a federal a federal issue, and she says. That's a price Washington should not ask one state citizens to bear. It says the bill's sponsor is a Democratic representative, Jean Labuda. She's of Denver. She says people want to know what's in the food that we're eating, said Labuda, who argued that food producers already have to label foods containing certain additives or allergens. So an added GMO label shouldn't be a burden. She goes on to say, for some reason, we are not afforded that same information when it comes to genetically engineered foods. We consumers deserve to know that information. And it goes on to talk about a wheat farmer who said that the GMOs can require fewer pesticides and less water. Well, that's not completely true. We're going to actually look at that today. Uh, another article and, and things that happened this week, some articles published this week possibly that uh, can, can debunk that idea. Uh, so it says many scientists say the labels aren't useful because genetically engineered and modified foods are safe. Well, which scientists are you talking about? Are you talking about the ones that work for the very biotech industry? Uh, the very ones that were testing Monsanto seeds before they were uh, put out? Is, are those the scientists you're talking about? The ones that say they're safe? The ones that have the very interest in the companies that they're working for? Quite possibly. Uh, also, the American Association for the Advancement of Science they published Science Magazine, has said that GMO, or genetically engineered food, is no different from conventional foods, and that labeling them would mislead and falsely alarm consumers. Well, I would suggest we just stop reading their publication, because obviously they don't know what they're talking about. They're no different than conventional foods. Have you not seen the studies that are out? Obviously not. Going on here, one of Colorado's members of Congress has suggested a, na a national labeling law. Democratic Representative Jared uh, Polis has said consumers need the information. Yes, we do need the information, and I don't care whether it happens on a national level or state level. We'll take either one, but I think it would be quite easy, uh, a lot easier to, to be pushed through in a state level. And recently, the, the New Mexico bill had got voted out as well. Uh, we're still working on one in Washington, maybe a couple other states. Uh, obviously, California with Prop 37, we didn't win that one, but we very, we lost by a, by a small margin, about 2 to 3% uh, from what I've read. And there's very great evidence that there was fraud involved in that. So 
there's an there's an idea here that we need to look at, and it's the fact that people want their food labeled. And there is a graph here on on this article, and I'll click on it here, uh, see if it'll bring it up. No, it won't bring it up. I'll show you here on the screen though. It is it's labeled uh, America wants GMOs labeled, and with that, I wanted to move on with some other GMO news, like I said, concerning labeling foods and concerning the so-called promises that the genetically engineered and, uh, and the biotechnology te industry has promised that these foods would yield, and, and they're quite not quite uh, pulling through with all the promises they said. So here's uh, those next articles. In countries, like I said, there's other countries that have required labeling of GMOs and in India they've passed this through here at the beginning of the year here in January they have passed the law concerning uh, labeling of GMOs and there's an article here from the digital journal it says GMO labeling signed into law in India it says the, the new year started with a new law in India January 1st requires as of January 1st all packaged foods containing any genetically modified organism must be labeled as such uh, there's this decision was made because many food products in India are either derived from or processed in countries where a large majority of the crops cultivated are largely genetically modified. And so the article goes on and lists different things. Um, they say that there's people saying there's a lack of clarity on the implementation. Um, he doesn't it that the labeling doesn't specify threshold limits or talks about traceability of uh, the, the liability of the aspects. And it's basically concerning packaged foods that they want to label because a lot, because India has a lot of foods from other countries and one of the U S being one of them. So of course they want to label that. Um, but really here, you know, that you can say, Oh, well, this isn't, this isn't, you know, you can come up with excuses of how, Oh, it's we're not ready to label it, or it's not completely clear. Well, I don't know what what's clear about it. It's, it either has it in there or it doesn't. I understand the traceability issues as I've looked at in the past. Uh, my series, all all my reports that I did in 2012 concerning uh, GMOs and and talking about how there's cross pollinization. Farmers that aren't growing it are finding their crops being infected with GMOs and things like that. And I understand the traceability issue, but if we know for sure that it's in there, it definitely needs to be labeled. And it just goes back to the whole idea, well, it, this is why we shouldn't have them in our environment. If it's that easy and it brings up the question of, oh, well, what about small trace amounts? Where are those trace amounts coming from? They're either added to the food intentionally or they're there because of an issue of, you know, the cross pollinization or uh, there's an issue with our food supply. That's what I look at here. There's an issue with the, the process at which our food comes to us. How is the stuff getting in there? And, and that that really is a whole nother issue, the traceability and, and talking about what trace amounts can be uh, considered to be fully genetic and, you know, requiring that, that thing to be labeled completely. So that's a different issue all in itself. But going on to the next article here, uh, U.S. farmers may stop planting GM crops after poor global yield. This is Farmers Weekly. I've been watching this uh, particular publication for quite some time online this year about different things that come out and, and they, they cover GMOs a lot and just the food supply all around from the farmer's perspective a lot of times. And so um, it says that some farmers are considering returning to conventional seed after increased pest resistance and crop failures mean GM crops saw smaller yields globally than their non-GM counterparts. Uh, it says farmers in the U.S. pay about $100 acre per acre more for, for genetically modified seed. Um, the problem is these farmers are paying extra for the technology but have seen yields which are no better than 10 years ago. They had originally suspected that seed um, resistance would begin 40 years later, but it's actually as few as 14 years we're seeing uh, crop resistance. It says some of the bugs will eat the plant and it makes them sick, but not kill them. There again, why do, why should we eat something that is making an insect sick? You know, obviously it's, it's an issue. He says, I now use, this one farmer says, I now use pesticides again, or insecticides again. Uh, 
It says 87% of U.S. farmers plant genetically modified seed. That's that's a huge issue. You know, we're relying on it. I understand that we've been nothing against farmers from my from my point of view that uh, it's it's these farmers have been lied to. They've been told by these technology companies like like uh, Monsanto saying you're going to get more crop yields you're going to have to use less pesticides it's going to be cheaper for you in the long run well we see here that uh, they're spending more for seed and they're not seeing any better results than they were 10 years ago and it says the top performing countries by crop yield last year were in Asia in particular China where farmers do not use genetically modified seed so could it be Could it be the way we're planting things? Could it be uh, the method of which we're planting? And could that be an, op an actual option in getting more yields? And I wanted to look at another story here. This is called uh, called India's Rice Revolution. And it's from, it's a quite lengthy article from The Guardian under their global development section. It talks about India's rice revolution. And it says, in a village in India's poorest state, Bihar, farmers are growing world record amounts of rice with no GM and no herbicide. Is this one solution to world food shortages? And it goes, it shows this farmer where he's going to be talking, the, the article is going to be talking about this farmer here. He had a, a huge crop yield this year and it says he, it wasn't 6 or even 10 or 20 tons, but he pulled in 22.4 tons of rice on one hectare of land. It was a world record with it was a world, he set a world record, and with rice, the staple food of more than half the world's population of 7 billion, this is great news. You know, this is one of the promises, and this is one of the benefits that uh, the biotech industry touts as using their genetically modified seed. This is seed that you buy, you buy every single year, it terminates, you can't use the seed again. In fact, if you even tried to, you would get in trouble by them. They've, they're suing farmers for uh, infringement for... Farmers that maybe not even planting their seed are getting sued by them because they say, well, you stole our seed when, when it was just carried over by wind or pollinization or something like that. So this is an issue. Um, and so it says that rice being a staple food item, this is one of the things that they tout as a, as a, positive, uh, a positive aspect of, of buying their seed is that, oh, it'll cure world hunger. We can grow so much more. The yields are so much more. Well, as I looked in the Farmer's Weekly article here, the last article, that's not the case. That's not always the case. And so it can't just be a blanket statement that we can rely on. But going to this article here, he says his friends and rivals all recorded over 17 tons and many others in the villages around claim to have more than doubled their usual yield. So this wasn't just a one, one case scenario. Uh, the state's chief prime minister came uh, to their village and to congratulate them, and the village was awarded with electric power, a bank, and new concrete bridge. So they were well rewarded for this. It was a big deal for them. Um, and then one of his uh, friends, it, it's not the end of the story, because one of his friends smashed the world record later on for potatoes six months later. He grew potatoes and, and smashed a record there, and so... 93% of the 100 million population depend on growing rice and potatoes. In previous years, farmers farming has not been very profitable, he said. He said his income has increased a lot. So this is the type of growth, you know, these men, these people tout that, oh, we're going to build up the third world and we're going to do all these things when they're doing many things quite opposite to hold them down. Well, this is the kind of thing that, that they're having success with, and it's, it's through just their... Um, their method of growing, and it, this this article goes on to talk about the increase in yields and the method that they're using. Uh, they use less seeds, less water, less chemicals, but they get more without having to invest more. Whereas in other parts of India, where the only genetically modified crop that has been grown there is the BT cotton, and that's what I've covered before, that the, it's been named the suicide belt because so many Indian farmers have committed suicide because They've invested in this BT cotton. They bought all these seeds and they've spent all this money with the promise that they're going to get more yield and be able to create the crops to support their family by selling them. And then they're not getting it and they're committing suicide. And it's just a sad situation. But then again, in, this, in the very same country of India, these farmers are having great success with rice that's not genetically modified. This is an example of 
some of the lies and disinformation that can be going around concerning the biotech industry and their promises that they make. But I want to point out one more thing in this article. It says at the end, it says if any scientist or a company came up with a technology that almost guaranteed a 50% increase in yields at no extra cost, they would get a Nobel Prize. But when young Biharian farmers do that, they get nothing. I only want to see the poor farmers have enough to eat. It looks like they're having great success here in India, and that's that's why I wanted to point that out, is it's not always uh, the case. And, you know, we've looked at the studies, and to make this quick and end up here before going to this video, we looked at the various studies, the issues concerning, the health issues concerning GM crops, and what what it's causing. We know that there's a problem with that, but yet there's a... There's another article I have here, just to go over it briefly, from Food Safety News, talking about the Peanut uh, Corporation of America, PCA. They're, the executive the executives have been, been indicted for fraud, conspiracy, and salmonella peanut butter outbreak. And this outbreak has, in 2009, killed nine people and sickened more than 700. So it is a major issue, and yes, they should get in trouble for it. But I'm showing you this article from this week because it's pointing to point out the fact that these guys are getting charged and indicted for uh, wire fraud and, and things like that, selling a product that they absolutely knew. Then there's proof showing that they knew that they was contaminated with salmonella, but they sent it out anyway. There is proof of this, but um, they sent it out anyway, and knowing that, that they could injure and, and sicken many people and possibly kill people, and that's what happened. These men are getting charged, but what about those that are in charge of selling these seeds and selling this this junk GMO foods and, and pushing it on us, these biotech industries. Again, I'm not going at the farmers. I'm going at the biotech companies that, that push it and say this is a great thing. What's happening to them? Nothing. They're getting promoted up into the FDA. They're getting moved into our government. They're getting big payoffs. And scientists that speak out against them are getting fired. Uh, Ahmad Pustai, uh, one of the uh, – Jeffrey M. Smith talks about him a lot and – just many things going on, but then these these guys here in this article that I'm looking at, they're getting indicted. They're getting in trouble, and they should if they really did what they said that they did. But without reading the rest here, you can go look at it yourself in the link I've provided. But this is the problem. This is this is the issue we're facing, and so that's why I want to look at this GMO a go go clip right here. This will give you and anyone you know a brief and quick insight onto what is going on with GM, GMO foods, the basics of it, what it is, and what it can do to us. So here is that clip right now. GMO a go go. Hey kid, what's up? Do you hate having to eat those healthy vegetables? Is nutrition getting you down? Well, cheer up! Help's on the way. Say hello to GMO, genetically modified organisms. You can eat them all day. Not only will mealtimes be extra delicious, they'll also contain oodles and oodles of insect genes and fish genes. Just think of all that extra yummy goodness. But that's not all. We're irradiating everything you eat, so you'll never have to absorb a single nasty nutrient ever again. And don't forget about pesticides, plenty of those. Yes, sir. Mm -mm. Like to know more? Well, let's take a look. Corn is a staple food used in many, many ways throughout the food industry. Growing it takes time, money, and lots of pesticides to protect the crops from bugs, vermin, and fungus. Now, some people think that pesticides made by big biotechs are harmful for humans, animals, and the environment, but that's okay. We've solved that problem. Our GM scientists are putting the pesticide right inside the crops. That's right. Isn't that amazing? The food itself will kill those pesky critters stone cold dead. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Now, some people are worried about the bees dying off. Busy bees pollinate billions of dollars worth of crops, vegetables, fruit, flowers, you name it. But some insects are just plain greedy. They'll eat everything in sight if you don't watch out. GMO to the rescue! Thanks to genetic engineering, the plant produces a toxin from the newly inserted bacterium gene. The toxin kills insects, but not humans. The Bacillus thuringiensis toxin destroys the insect's stomachs. Ouch. We have absolutely no testing results to prove that these are safe, but they are. Trust us. We care. And because the pesticides are already growing right inside the crop, GM plants can withstand more weed killer than the old-fashioned organic crops. No weeds, no bugs. More food, more profit. What's not to like? But that GMO goodness isn't just about corn. There's rice, soybeans, cotton, alfalfa, soybeans, papaya, soybeans, oilseed rape. Is that all? Not on your life. GM is the gift that keeps on giving. The possibilities are endless. Just imagine you're a limey Brit trying to grow strawberries in the frozen wastes of Scotland land. Well, in the future, why not insert a gene from a codfish who's built to thrive in the icy North Atlantic? Result, frost-resistant strawberries. Wow, I want it now. The effects of GMO food on humans aren't as tried and tested as we'd like, but there are much more important things that need our attention right away. The population is exploding. How will we feed everyone? We need food security, and we need it now. But just because tests on rats eating genetically modified potatoes showed them growing slower after two or three generations and developing fertility problems, oh, and some organ development issues, some goody two-shoes scientists and whiny campaigners worry that that might happen to humans too. Well, let's wait and see. In the meantime, the biotech companies can rake in the profits that will fund more exciting GMO experiments. We love of farms. We love them so much, we want them all. We want to persuade every potential partner farmer to forget all about that silly organic farming and get with us on the GMO bandwagon. Whenever we change the natural gene sequence of any plant, we get a patent, ASAP. It's our invention after all. Hey, the new GMO plants are our intellectual property. We aim to achieve total control of the seed. Got an organic farm nearby? Great! Soon everything you grow will be enhanced by the altered genes from our GM crops. Isn't nature wonderful? And what better way to spread the GMO goodness around than the wind? Accidental cross-pollination isn't our problem, and it's no excuse for profit loss. And once our genes get into your crops, your crops belong to us. Yep, well, it's our technology. If you're going to use it, you've got to pay. We don't care how it got there. When we own the food, we will own life. So those naughty farmers better not save their seeds for next year's crop. If they do, we'll know. We'll tie up farmers for years in the courts. Farmers will just have to buy more seeds next year and more pesticides too. It's win-win all around. If you want to fight us, we might just take your farm as a settlement. But we're human, just Thanks, Mother Nature, but we'll take it from here. But we're doing all this for you, Johnny. Don't forget that. And if it's all too much for you to take in, don't worry. We've got it all figured out. By the time you're a teenager, it'll be GMO a go-go. We just need to make sure that our army of lobbyists keep GMO labeling off any products. Why spoil consumers with unnecessary choices after all? And if old farmer Joe decides to fight us, we have a ready-made network waiting to take care of him. Can you say revolving door? Yep. 
Some judges used to be lawyers who worked for us, and we make sure that they take care of business. And legislation, no problem either. Former GM industry lawyers also work for the food regulation bodies. And we have enough cash in our pockets to lobby any issues all the way to Saturn and back. Some people still think government food regulatory bodies are serving their needs. Hilarious. We are making a killing in India, literally. Hundreds of thousands of farmers have been organically recycled to dodge debts that they owe us. BT cotton doesn't always give strong yields, and bullworm, cotton's main pest, seems to be gaining resistance to our transgenic BT cotton. This can mean bad crops and no revenue for some. We say once you're in, you're in. However, under Indian law, any debts die with the farmers, so farmer suicides stop debts being passed on to any remaining family. But I'm confident that we can lobby that issue too. When we own all of the cotton varieties, and we will, suicides will be of little concern because we'll be the only cotton seed suppliers. Duh! Concerns have been raised in Europe over problems with GMO pig feed causing sterilization and growth problems, but we have years of marketing left before that's proved. And we'll find a way to work with the Danish pig farmers banging that drum. So eat up your veggies, Johnny. There's going to be plenty for everyone for the right price. So that was uh, GMO a go go. Uh, I recommend you uh, look at the sites uh, listed in that, the, the authors and the producers of it listed in, in in the video and visiting their sites and and reposting it, re redistributing it like they have encouraged and like I'm doing right here with you uh, to to your contacts and your connections. And without further ado, uh, that's that's all the time I have today. So until next time, thank you for joining me.